Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to EWC Insights Asia Pacific Transitions. My name is Tanwin Yoking. I am a research fellow at the East West Center, and I am delighted to be moderating today's event. For today's session, we have a presentation from Dr. Ryan Longman. Ryan is a fellow in the research program at the East West Center. He works closely with the Pacific Islands Development Program. His research is focused on monitoring, acquisition, quality control, product creation, and dissemination of climate data in the Pacific. He is most interested in doing work that builds on adaptive capacities, promotes cultural stewardship, and improves environmental awareness. And for his talk this afternoon, he will be highlighting past achievements, ongoing projects, and future trajectory of the Pacific Drought Knowledge Exchange. Mm. In terms of logistics, Ryan's presentation will be roughly 40 minutes long. And after the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. If you would like to ask Ryan a question, feel free to submit your question in the, in the Q&A box, and we will try our best to get through as many questions as possible. Our next EWC Insight speaker will be Dr. Tammy Tabe, and her talk is entitled Land, Displacement, Continuity, Stories from the Gilbertese People in the Solomon Islands. And her talk will be held on July 20th at 2 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Without further ado, I will end the introduction here. And Ryan, the virtual stage is yours. Aloha Kako, colleagues. Um, thank you, Pan Nguyen, for that nice introduction. We're seeing the uh, screen and everything okay? All right. So uh, yeah, really happy to be here today. Um, appreciate the invitation. Uh, I think it's unique because this is the project that actually brought me to the East West Center, uh, but it's actually the first time that it's been formally uh, presented um, in an East West Center format. So again, really great privilege to share this with uh, my colleagues uh, here and um, in, the, in the community. So today's roadmap uh, starts with, uh, it's gonna be pretty simple. We're gonna talk about how we got to this point with the project, uh, what we're up to now and uh, where we're headed uh, with this project. So uh, and I'll you know, organize the, the, the presentation this way. Before I get going though, I want to do some acknowledgements and you know, typically this is done in, at the end of the presentation, but I wanted to, to highlight this at the beginning. And I wanted to first acknowledge Dr. Abby Frazier, uh, formerly East West Center and currently at the Clark University, and Dr. Christian Giardina at the U.S. Forest Service in Hilo. And uh, they are two of the co-PIs on this project. And without the force of three that we have been, um, I'm not sure we would have made it this far. So I really want to send a shout out to them. And also Derek Ford, who joined the team uh, at the East West Center um, in January. And then um, I'll be highlighting some research that's, that's been taking place um, from some of these folks. And I'll I'll bring them in when, um, when, when the research emerges, but I want to thank them also. And then Patrick Grady, who's been developing our web resources. I want to thank the, the, the main funders so far who have funded the project and uh, show you guys front and center our fancy logo that we have here for the PDKE, which um, you'll be seeing a lot of uh, this presentation. So without further ado, um, let's get going here. Um, so how do we get here? What is the PDKE and, and, and how do we end up here? Well, first let's start, I'm a geographer. So let's start with a map. Uh, we were focusing our efforts here in Hawaii uh, to start the PDKE, but we also uh, had a vision of um, having the US API included as well. So if you don't know what the US API is or the US affiliated Pacific Islands, they include um, two territories, Guam and America Samoa. Uh, one Commonwealth, uh, the Northern Mariana Islands, and then three independent nations, uh, Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands. And if you want to put this into perspective, if you were to overlay this geography across, um, across the landscape, you'd see that it covers, you know, from, from really up here in uh, northeastern Canada, all the way across to, to the uh, Western Pacific, and then down in the Caribbean there. So it's a really large spatial extent. And also, it's very diverse. So there's some um, high islands and there's some uh, low islands or atolls and they have very distinct uh, characteristics in terms of their rainfall uh, and their uh, um, ecosystems and uh, their availability of resources. So um, uh, very diverse. 
Uh, in terms of diversity, though, in Hawaii and other Hawaiian islands, I think it's important here uh, when you're doing anything climatically or addressing any type of um, research that involves environmental phenomenon is to really understand what a unique place Hawaii is and other high Pacific islands in terms of rainfall. So we receive our rainfall from the northeast trade winds uh, that gives us this wet windward slopes and these dry windward, uh, dry leeward areas. And it creates this really, um, these amazing differences, these gradients that are just unique to, um, unique to high islands in the Pacific. Uh, you get 10 inches of rainfall here in the Waikoloa area on the Big Island, uh, 25 inches in Honolulu. These are leeward areas, but then if you look at the windward side, you have 250 inches per year, um, 300 inches per year, and then really the wettest place on, um, on, in Hawaii is Big Bog of Maui, which you get uh, 400 inches. So I, I want to just direct your attention here to this scale bar down here, and if you just kind of look at about um, 50 kilometers here and, and put it, I mean, maybe it's about 75 kilometers from a place that gets 10 inches per year and a place that gets 300 inches per year. So that really highlights um, just really how how in, insane the gradients are and how on a continental scale, you wouldn't even get this over you know several thousands or, of kilometers. So uh, it makes things like looking at environmental phenomenon and map making maps and all these things very complicated in Hawaii. Now, in terms of... Um, Impacts of climate change, I think folks on this call, a lot of them are going to be familiar that there's a lot of um, the Pacific Islands are really at the forefront of uh, global climate change, dealing with things like sea level rise, you know, um, wildfires and uh, drought is a, is a particular one. So I think um, a lot of times that gets lost in translation that, you know, islands are, you know, tropical places with waterfalls and uh, and uh, wet places, but uh, really uh, no island is immune from the impacts of drought. For example, if we look at just Hawaii alone, we can look at the U.S. Drought Monitor, and you can see that uh, this is from 2000 to 2020, and all of these colored uh, bars here are are indicating some level of drought, whether it's moderate to severe. So, uh, history uh, Hawaii has a very long history of drought. So, some of the motivations for the project they stemmed early on. Uh, with the work of Dr. Abby Frazier, looking at drying trends in Hawaii that kind of ended in around 2012. Then some other work in the Pacific was pointing towards evidence of a, of a kind of a sustained or a more frequent drying. And a lot of questions started emerging. So how is drought changing over time? Is there a climate change signal? Uh, what are the impacts of drought on the Pacific? And really how can science better inform uh, managers in terms of dealing with drought? So some work that's ongoing right now, um, uh, building on that 2012 work, was to kind of look at, at, at some of the characteristics of drought. So drought frequency, the duration, and total magnitude. And some of the evidence now between the 100 or so years of rainfall records that we have, um, we're seeing kind of these, these increases in all three of those metrics. So it's kind of pointing towards this situation where you know um, drought could be something that is more frequent and um, lasting longer and just having a bigger magnitude. So uh, Dr. Abby Frazier again uh, published a, a report on a general technical report with the Forest Service on managing the effects of drought. They looked at drought on these four different sectors, water resources, agriculture, wildfire prevention, and endangered species. And they're trying to dig in and kind of figure out what those impacts were across those sectors. They looked at drought in terms of these five different types of drought. So you had meteorological drought, which is these uh, changes in kind of short-term rainfall. Um, there's agricultural drought, this is when crops start getting affected. Hydrological, hydrological drought, that's when the, you start seeing this in your, your surface uh, flows of water streams, uh, lakes and base flows. And then ecological drought. This is when the forest becomes really dry and creates additional fuels that can be that can cause fire uh, forest fires to spread rapidly. And then socioeconomic drought. And this is when people start getting impacted by their availability of water. So it was an excellent report. Uh, you know, I'm drawing on it heavily in our, our research we're doing today, but it really left a bunch of questions on the table, kind of set the stage for where we're at. Uh, some of the questions were. What resources were being used by managers to get their information about drought? What kind of decisions were being made with that information? Uh, was this information being incorporated into some type of planning activities? 
Um, and then what kind of products were really useful for these different sectors? And all of these kind of questions led to this need for a knowledge exchange. These things in this general technical report pointed to the fact that resource managers really wanted to be more engaged in the process. There's a lot of limited training and access to information. Folks didn't even really know what was out there. There's no centralized kind of clearinghouse that stores drought or climate information. And really there was a need for like a more formal exchange of information. And luckily there was the Pacific Fire Exchange, which is kind of a model and kind of what you know, stirred up this idea for a drought exchange. So enter the Pacific Drought Knowledge Exchange. This was a pilot project that was funded by the Pacific Island Climate Science Center. And we were working with three partners, uh, Monica Halavai on Maui, Baba Forest Reserve on the Big Island, and also Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. And what thing, one thing was unique about this proposal is that it was actually written with the resource managers uh, as, as part of the, the author team. And this kind of really got immediate buy-in to a pilot right away. We didn't have to go out and look for, um, for partners. They were kind of there at the onset. And that really, I think, well, argue led to the success of the pilot. So working with these managers, um, we kind of went on this journey and we we're trying to demonstrate these four aspects of a knowledge exchange. The first one was easier access to drought and climate information. So again, um, you know, uh, providing these data sources uh, for, for managers in a relatively simplified manner. Uh, better, more comprehensive information. So again, a lot of the data out there isn't really publicly available or it's, uh, it's in formats that aren't accessible to managers. So you know, providing them access to information. Uh, technical uh, assistance. So uh, you know, creating maps, using code, using algorithms to kind of extract data at certain site locations, uh, some uh, that skills that managers may not have or that they may uh, not have the time to execute. And then most importantly, really, a more collaborative information transfer environment. And I'll just speak to this for a minute. This is really the idea of co-production. And I think that um, if you folks aren't familiar with co-production, put it this, put it, uh, look at it this way. It's a typical academic model is to be up in the ivory tower creating your research and just putting it out to a journal or a report or sending it to a land manager and hoping that it gets utilized. You know, crossing your fingers and hoping it makes a difference in the world, which it may or may not. But the co-production model kind of takes it a different approach. You start working with the resource manager right on the onset, start asking the resource manager questions. Well, what kind of products do you need? And then there's an iterative exchange as the, as the, the relationship continues where the product is co-produced with both the sci scientist skill and the manager's input so that it's almost guaranteed to have some type of relevance on the ground and um, applicability um, um, for research managers. So the project kicked off. We had a couple of stakeholder engagements. Uh, we got to do the road show in February 2020. And then everybody knows what happened in March 2020. We moved to the virtual environment for our third uh, stakeholder. And uh, but we did uh, we got it was nice to get out get out on the Big Island and, and meet some folks and kind of really set the stage for for these future engagements that, that happened virtually after that. So the one thing that emerged early on was what we're calling it's kind of our business card it's our call or our calling card for the PDKE which is our CCVD portfolio the climate change climate variability and drought portfolio and what this is it's an automated tool that. Uh, grabs a hold of all of this uh, gridded data and, and products that are available right now and synthesizes it for individual geographies. So for example, um, you just need to upload a spatial information like a shape file or coordinates, and then uh, the, the code does the rest and spits out 30 pages worth of information that's site specific to uh, individual geographies. And I'm gonna have uh, um, Catherine uh, drop a link in the chat here uh, to give you uh, this, this particular example here. But what's in there uh, is climate characteristics. Uh, we have monthly rainfall trends and variability over about 100 years of rainfall records. We have some ecological characteristics, uh, fire occurrence, base of species. We have uh, future climate projections for uh, temperature and rainfall under two different climate uh, scenarios and uh, under two different products. Uh, historical drought information in you know, visual and tabular formats. And then we have some analyses and summaries, like a paragraph that you could literally copy and paste and put into a proposal that describes kind of uh, the characteristics of individual geographies. 
And again, it's touch of a button stuff to create this. I've made about a hundred of these so far for resource managers across Hawaii. So what we're doing then, this is the PDK approach is we have our excited partner, we give them our calling card, our CCV portfolio, and then we can take a look with them. We can look at the manager, we can look at the portfolio, we could say, well, um, are, we, are we focused on the area you're interested in? So for example, Hawaii Volcanoes is a very big place. Maybe the folks are interested in a smaller subunit of that. So we can kind of maybe create a portfolio for a smaller subunit. We'll take a deeper dive in that regard. So we can reevaluate and re revise these portfolios over and over again. Also with these engagements, we're documenting stories, lessons learned, and then we're co-developing some other tools such as fact sheets, presentations, educational materials, kind of uh, meeting whatever the stakeholders needs are at that point. And then, as we have more stakeholders, we're building this kind of cross-site um, you know, uh, clearinghouse of information, and that's going to be in a, a website form, um, but um, that's going to be available for folks to, to learn from these lessons as well and to, to access these products. <clears throat> so some of the products that have emerged so far, we have some fact sheets uh, that we've generated for our partners in the, in the pilot, impacts of El Nino, future climate projections, historical drought and uh, fire risk and occurrence. I have a very talented graphic designer at SOAS, Brooks Bays, that's, that's helped us produce these. And uh, again, these were uh, uh, designed in the co-production format. So for example, at Hawaii Volcanoes, the resource managers were interested in producing a product that was, that could be given to staff. And they wanted the staff to you know, not feel gloom and doom. They wanted them to be inspired about doing good restoration and management. So we you know we tailored the, the the fact sheets for the staff of the park, and then at Pu Bava, they're more interested. They have a lot of community groups that help them there, so they were interested in having something that they could pass it out to the community and have them connect more with the uh, with the land and with some of the climate information related to their individual geography. So again, this process was uh, was stakeholder uh, driven in the co production model. Another uh, product that emerged in the pilot was the Hawaii Droughts Needs Assessment. So this is uh, right now currently uh, on the verge of publication um, to be determined, uh, but uh, we, we, we got to put together at least. It's a literature review of uh, drought activities that have happened over the last couple of years. It also um, highlights meetings with resource managers, some workshops and trainings that have taken place in Hawaii. And then we're drawing on one-on-one uh, -on -one manager interviews and a statewide drought information survey. And this was done by Melissa Coons from, uh, from the uh, UH Manoa NREM department right now. And she just, uh, for her master's work, and she's kind of still working on the periphery of, of, of these, um, these topics. And then we have indigenous drought knowledge assessment. And that was work led up by uh, Dr. Katie Canella-Mella from the Akaka Foundation. So, um, you know, this, this, this should be published uh, pretty soon here, but it's gonna be a valuable resource for, for folks in Hawaii. Another uh, activity that we did was an eight week uh, course uh, to uh, engage with land managers to run them through a climate adaptation workshop. Uh, it was basically co-hosted by the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Sciences or NIACS and the East West Center. And uh, we engaged with 42 different participants from 19 different organizations. And we kind of worked them through some, some uh, we first gave them the CCVD portfolio right off the bat. They were bought in and we, um, we, work, we walk through this adaptation workbook process here. You can see on the right where you kind of look at a problem and, and try to address it, especially in terms of a changing environmental conditions like rising temperatures or decreasing rainfall. And what was unique about this was we actually got this, the workshop results published in uh, the bulletin of the American Meteorological uh, Society. Uh, their flagship journal is BAMS. So it's a very high visibility, and we actually got this the result of the workshop published there. So that was a big, um, um, a big accomplishment for us. It's not a very complicated paper, and um, you can drop a link in the chat here for you. But I'm really proud of this paper because uh, it really highlights the effort needed for cultural stewardship uh, when you're engaging with indigenous communities and bringing them into a workshop environment with a bunch of federal folks how to kind of uh, delicately approach that and do it with care and how to, you know, really some best practices for a uh, workshop environment. So for folks that are, that are leading up workshops, uh, you know, I recommend giving it a quick read. Let's read. Okay, so that's what, we're, that's how, that's what got us to this point. That's all the stuff we did in the last uh, couple of years. And, uh, and this is where we're at now. And I'm gonna run you guys through um, a, some, several projects that were currently being implemented. 
But first, I kind of want to express that we are we are operating now not on a single funded project. The original project was just a year of funding, but we have created something. It's kind of like this umbrella, um, PDKE umbrella, where we're kind of bringing in projects kind of under this this um, this design. Now it's not so much more a single funded project that's going to end. It's kind of this this uh, entity at this point and we're 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 refining that um daily here but i also like to think of it as a vessel right so it's a vessel that allows us to access new places we can work with new resource managers in those places we can engage with new communities and it's going to allow us to program new activities so kind of under this pdke banner as long as we can find the funding the fuel to keep it going i think um you know we've kind of already built the basis of of, of it so one of the projects that we are currently working on is a we are developing a drought the decision support tool for ranchers, and we are co-developing this tool with ranchers using that so, that same co-production model. We're working with the Hawaii Cattlemen's Council. They are helping us facilitate those interactions with ranchers, and the tool we're developing right now we're calling it the Hawaii Rangeland Information Portal. And what it does is it provides a three-month projection of rainfall and forage growth based on the El Nino Southern Oscillation or ENSO uh, different phases. And it's kind of an almanac perspective. So if you're in a strong El Nino, it says you're gonna potentially get this much rainfall on average or your worst case scenario is uh, this much rainfall. So it kind of, it doesn't really use a fancy model to make a projection. It says, this is what happened in the past in your particular geography. And we're giving, providing the ranchers some site-specific information, some real-time information and historical information about their individual geographies, and then some actual decision support. So what can you expect your quarterly forage production to be? Uh, is your site stable? Will it be stable over the next couple of months? And then what, what can you expect to be the number of grazing days? And that's, this work's being led up by Cher, uh, Cheryl Hugh, who uh, is a talented young lady that's um, been developing these websites and Shereel is going to be coming on, working on some additional years of funding that we got for, uh, from NIDIS for this project. Uh, NIDIS is the National Integrated Drought Information System. And so we'll be continuing to build this tool out. But I just want to give you a quick snapshot uh, of the homepage here. You kind of take a look and see what phase of ENSO you're in. You can access some widgets. Uh, this is just a mock-up here, but some access some climate widgets that are related to Hawaii. And then, um, what you do is then the next step is you pick your geography. So these are all ranches in Hawaii or areas uh, near ranches and um, click your individual geography. And so for example, if we click, click this one here, uh, your next prompt is to enter your grass type, the number of animals you have on your property, the number of, um, the number of uh, acres that they're grazing on, and then you'll get an output again, based on that El Nino production. So, this is giving you the uh, historical average and the historical low, and it's actually giving you some guidance here. So it's going to be less than uh, the average production is expected, or you should think about destocking or supplementing your feeding. So again, we're not trying to um, we're, we're trying to give ranchers information that's based on um, that's based on their uh, you know again what's happened in the past and not not so much what we think is going to happen in the future. Uh, you can also access other information on this tool, like the last 12 months of rainfall and temperature, evapotranspiration, and you can look at some of these rainfall project projections uh, visually as well. Another thing we're doing on this project, or kind of on the periphery here, is we're pulling in kind of real-time climate data uh, from the Hawaii Climate Data Portal, and I'll talk about that in a, in a couple more slides from now. But uh, the portal allows us to access real-time, uh, near real-time temperature and rainfall data. And one thing that's interesting is that I've just started having some conversations with the Department of Agricultural Risk Management Agency, or the RMA, to bring an insurance product to Hawaii to help ranchers uh, uh, you know, mitigate against the impacts of drought. And this started uh, where you know, they reached, someone reached out to me, a consultant, um, and was uh, like, well, the ranchers in Hawaii really want this product, but the RMA can't do it because there's really no high quality Graded rainfall, it's too hard. And as I mentioned, those gradients, it's it, with their model, they have the map rainfall. They can't do it because Hawaii is so complicated. Well, I'm like, well, we just happen to have done this for the Hawaii Climate Data Portal. So now I'm kind of getting into some conversations with them, and they say it's going to take about a year. 
but it's a goal of mine to really see if I can do everything I can to help bring this insurance product to Hawaii because in talking with the Hawaii Cattlemen's Council, there seems to be a great need for that. So I think it's something that the PDKE can do that's really going to make an impact. Uh, another thing that we're developing, and this is I just pulled this out of my email yesterday. It's in the early phases, but we're developing a mobile app uh, as part of the project as well. Shreel's doing that. And it's going to be something where a rancher can kind of open up and just get the real-time conditions at their individual geography. So what was the rainfall like yesterday? What's the current drought condition? What uh, phase of El Nino are we in? What was the temperature like? And again, this is really in the, in the early works, um, uh, but I think it's going to also be something that's really going to add a lot of value to the project. Uh, another project we're working on is scaling up the PDKE efforts in the US API. So we got some funding from um, Pacific Island Climate Adaptation Science Center for this is a pretty small proposal, but we're, we're, we're really making it work, um, stretching it out and, uh, and doing our, uh, getting our PDKE footprint um, a little further west, uh, doing some work in Guam, Palau, uh, and Yap, which is part of the uh, Federated States of Micronesia. And the first thing we kind of did right off the bat once we hired Derek was we started working on um, making some rainfall maps uh, for Guam. So we're doing things like quality controlling the data, gap filling it, we, we compared a couple methods, and now we have a, a product that is pretty good. So this is just, a, I won't go into this, but it's a relationship between our predicted results and the map results, and we're really confident. So we're moving forward now with this gridded product. And I think what it's gonna do, it's gonna open a door for a lot of things, like for one, we can start doing Guam CCVD portfolio because we have that gridded rainfall now. So we can, you know, and there's an interest in that. There's a national park on Guam. They've already reached out to me and asked about a portfolio for them. So we're going to start exploring that. We also can potentially move these rainfall maps into the Hawaii Climate Data Portal so that folks can visualize them and download them. And then I think that, you know, once you have a gridded product like this, you can start answering a lot of research questions about historical drought about impacts of El Nino and a lot of different things. So um, it's really, you know, just we're just getting started in, in, in uh, tapping into these products and they're available to other folks too um, to answer research questions. So um, we'll be rolling those out um, rather soon. Another thing we're doing in Guam, we're, we've taken some existing work on um, uh, climate downscaling of future projections and we've kind of uh, put them into some, you know, easily digestible figures uh, for rainfall and temperature, we have the low emission and high emission scenarios, and then we are looking at historical drought conditions and fire occurrence, and again, creating products that are really simple, you know, you, leveraging technical skills that Derek and, and I have, and just kind of creating these things and putting them out there so folks can utilize them on the ground in Guam for whatever educational or resource management uh, decisions they need to make. We're also uh, upping our fact sheet game in Guam. We have a couple fact sheets that are currently, two of them are in the draft form right now. We have a third one that's in development and we are working with um, the uh, University of Guam and the Guam Department of Agriculture to help get feedback and make these really Guam specific uh, bits of information. And then I'll be leveraging um, the Pacific Island Development Program, which has a real uh, you know, strong connections to Guam to make sure that these products are, are, are well distributed and get the visibility um, they need for usefulness um, on the ground there. A third project that's going on is the development of educational materials and resources. So uh, Emily uh, Cessno and Cheryl Hugh are working on developing a curriculum for uh, K to 12 uh, teachers. Uh, we got a link here that I just got also in my email this morning that uh, we'll share with you. Um, the educational resources are meant to kind of take this information, some of it from the PDKE products, and put it into a curriculum so that teachers can utilize it in their classrooms. And I think this is kind of a low-hanging fruit for a lot of work that we're doing right now is how do we take this information and, and really get the, the value out of it, right? So it's one thing for a resource manager to get it and to, to use it for potentially making management decisions, but what, you know, why can't an elementary school kid tap into that information as well? or um, you know, a high school or college, I mean, across the board is a way to look at this information that we're, we're pulling together and putting it in ways um, that can be um, <clears throat> digested by a range of, um, of students. So we're talking, there's some draft story maps that are available now, and we're, we're thinking about doing some tutorials on simple uh, coding and uh, potentially making some CCVD portfolios for some of the schools in Hawaii. Some of the ideas that are being tossed around this project's also being funded by the by the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center. 
Then another project that's going on is the translation of the 10 existing fact sheets that we have to a little Hawaiian. And this is being led by Dr. Alyssa Anderson. And so we have all 10 fact sheets that are currently in the works now and being translated to a little Hawaiian. And I think that I just want to speak to this, what an amazing effort this is. First of all, it's just beautiful to see these fact sheets um, presented this way, but also uh, one thing that's being learned along the way that this is really a, a delicate process that, that's not easy to do. It's not, you don't put this into Google Translate and, uh, and get the words out the other end. It's, uh, it's something that takes a lot of care and detail. And a lot of these words like climate downscaling, they don't exist in the Hawaiian language. So you have to really uh, think about this and how you're going to present this stuff, be respectful to the language and also convey the message. So I know this is working really hard on this. Again, we have uh, Brooks um, Bays helping us uh, develop these. So these will be available pretty soon. I'm not sure how they'll be rolled out, but I'm um, really looking forward to sharing those with folks. Uh, and then finally, the final project I want to talk to you about, it's more of an activity, is that we are, you know, that ship I showed you, we are, we are, are we're putting as many people in that ship as possible. We are developing what we call an alliance model around the PDKE. So again, we're not, the PDKE is not a single project. It's, a, it's an idea um, that's supported by a lot of different entities at this point. So we had a kickoff meeting in December and uh, we're kind of rolling with that. Uh, we had about 60 people show up and we kind of you know, structured a kind of a core team, a leadership team and an advisory council. And now we're thinking forward for things like putting together more of a formal um, structure, a uh, code of conduct, and then you know trying to build in some steady funding streams. So if you are on the call and your logo is not in the logo soup here on the right, then you're welcome to uh, to contact me and we can get you involved in there. And if you want to fund a project or something, we're we're always happy to to see uh, what we can do. All right. So I know I'm I'm, I'm spilling a lot of information on you, but uh, we're almost there. We're two thirds of the way there. Now I want to talk about where we're headed with the project. Okay. And um, I think um, there's a lot. There's a lot to look forward to. The first thing is that we're going to be scaling up the PDKE uh, in Hawaii. We have a, another funding proposal uh, we've been sitting on for a little while through the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center that is going to allow us to engage with about 10 new partners in Hawaii. It's going to provide us resources to hire a new team member, and we're really going to start streamlining the co-production process so that we can engage effectively with all 10 uh, new partners. We're also developing a uh, website uh, that's being led by Patrick Grady. And a lot of the resources that I've been sharing with you are gonna be available there. And we're gonna try to really um, create this drought uh, clearinghouse of information that was uh, kind of identified early on in, in Navi's work. <clears throat> uh, another uh, effort is to expand up into the US API. So we have uh, a funding stream. Again, we're doing work there now. We have some money from NIDIS that's also coming online in the next year is gonna allow us to do a little more work in the US API, which is great, but I'm starting to get a lot of ideas and things that we can do here. Uh, well, Chamorro translated fact sheets, uh, go given the success we're seeing with the Hawaii translated ones and the interest, uh, we're looking at maybe writing a proposal to get some Chamorro translation going on. CCVD portfolios for Guam, which I mentioned, uh, rainfall maps for American Samoa, which is something that I think we can do pretty easy because we're just coming off that effort from Guam and same kind of the same methods I think would work well there. Uh, fact sheets for other countries. So again, uh, with Palau and Yap are, are, are in the proposal. And then really um, tying things into the, to the Hawaii climate data portal, uh, building a Pacific data portal. And I'm already kind of in the in the, the early stages of this right now and mapping out how we can tie in more Pacific information into the, into the infrastructure of the Hawaii Climate Data Portal. So um, I do want to take a minute to speak about the Hawaii Climate Data Portal. I, I really don't have the time to go to give it the attention it deserves, but this is a project that I've been working on for the last four years or so, maybe even longer at this point. And I've been kind of working on the PDKE HDP projects kind of in isolation, but I'm kind of getting to a point now where I'm seeing a lot of synergies and a lot of things that we can kind of do to bridge these projects together. And um, so what is the HTDP? It's basically a kind of one-stop shop for climate and data information in Hawaii. You can go there and get uh, actual data, you can get maps, you can get, um, you know, there's qualitative information, journal articles, there's cultural uh, knowledge, there's all kinds of different things on the Hawaii Climate Data Portal. And we can drop a link in the chat here for you if you want to poke around on it. Um, but again, how can, I, how can I utilize this for the PDKE project? 
Uh, well, for one, it's near real-time information. So I can pull that out for ranchers, that, that mobile app that I was talking about. We can develop that with the real-time information. And then um, what I've been in conversations about is building in the cyber infrastructure to actually create these CCVD portfolios with a touch of a button uh, where you would go in and either pick a drop-down menu from the Hawaii Climate Data Portal that, that gives you a particular geography, a national park or a, a conservation area, or I've been told that we could even develop it so you could draw an area. So you could draw a box around a school or you could uh, do whatever you wanted to really, to really get, um, to get that specific area that you're interested in. And um, then you would hit a button and you would get a CCV portfolio, just like I've been generating with the static data, but it would be dynamic. You would have yesterday's rainfall, yesterday's temperature, all of these things up into the near real time. And it's gonna take a proposal probably to get this going, but I think it's possible. And the cyber infrastructure guys tell me they can do it. So I think that that's kind of the leveling up the next generation on the CCBD portfolio and really merging this with the HCDP. Some of the new products that are coming online, we have these fire risk maps that are going to be available through a project with the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Those are, those are being developed now. We have land cover maps, vegetation maps, daily rainfall maps that are in development and really much more. So, um, I mean, the, the HCDP is in its infancy. We, it got rolled out with temperature and rainfall, but really there's a lot more to come. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's really limitless what we can do with this data. I wanna kind of run folks through, just so you know what I'm talking about, what this really is, is HCDP and give you an idea of what we're doing. We're basically, we're basically grabbing all of this real-time data that's available through these, these national repositories we also have these local networks. We have the Hawaii Mesonet coming online with a uh, hundred new stations over the next three years. And we're grabbing that data in a um, the telemeter data in a um, you know in a, in a data stream and pulling it into the HTTP. And we're standardizing it because they're all a little different. We're flagging it, we're gap filling it, we're aggregating it, and then we're using sophisticated interpolation methods to actually create gridded products. And then those created products are then available for visualization and download through the HEDP. And then as new data comes in, we call that latent data uh, for various reasons. It might not come in because it's manually read or there's a lag in the, in the quality control on the, on the, on the um, repository side. That kind of comes through the system also. We create an archival product and then that's available also through the, um, through the, uh, the portal as well. So, Again, it's, uh, I, I want to take a time to show you this because that's how we're getting these gridded products. And we've spent so much time developing this. So I think it's going to be really um, a high quality um, information and that we're really, it's going to change the way that we do research in Hawaii, having this quick and easy access to data. It allows us, all the tools I'm talking today are starting to think about developing off of this HCDP. And then all the researchers from here forward that are going to spend less time gathering data and more time actually doing analyses. It's streamlining the whole process. So if folks are interested, I do a weekly uh, social media post, uh, and this could be really on anything, um, but I try to cover these topics, current weather conditions, uh, future projections, uh, to any type of historical trend, news research, publications, projects that are coming out. I try to do at least one post a month on some cultural knowledge about um, climate understanding. And um, no, it's not, uh, there probably won't be a PDKE uh, Instagram um, or Twitter, but I'm, I'm kind of running some of that information through this Hawaii climate portal because the Hawaii climate portal is basically, it's not, it's a mechanism to really get all that kind of information out there. And I just want to give a shout out to Amy Schreiber, who uh, is the person that actually does the post. I actually create the content. She does the post. I don't even know the password. And I really, I'm appreciative that she does that uh, each week for me. Um, so um, let me wrap up with a couple conclusions here. Uh, I do thank you for, for staying with us. The, the pilot project really was a huge success. It, dem it really uh, demonstrated that what co-production can do and how you can create these products uh, you know, with this co-production model that are really relevant. I have the stakeholders and the pilots still reaching out to me, thanking me and telling me how they're utilizing this information. It's a really good feeling to, to have your work uh, be being utilized on the ground. 
Uh, we also um, have expanded the PDKE to work with uh, diverse partners. So again, we are already in the Pacific working with folks and in Hawaii. And again, I've given out a hundred of these portfolios. I met a guy in the park and was telling him about this and went home and made him one. So, I mean, it's that easy and, uh, and I'm happy to share that information. And folks, they really feel like connected when they see their geography, their land, presented that way. They don't have to go look on a map and find a value somewhere and go to, go to a scale bar. They can see what is temperature projected in their geography? What is rainfall projected? What is the average climate conditions? And it really connects people to the land through the climate data. Uh, we're continuing to grow our team. We're, we're building this alliance model with folks and we are bringing on, a, like I said, a new hire. Things are getting bigger and better. And really the future is looking bright. It might be a little drier, but it's definitely gonna be bright. and um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing where this all goes. So um, I'm going to end by thanking really uh, a ton of people here that have had some hand or, or word in the process and a bunch of more logo soup down there so folks can, can see. And I um, uh, definitely wanted to spend some time on this presentation, um, you know, acknowledging a lot of the folks that have put some hard work in across the board. I feel like the you know, projects are, silos are coming down, folks are getting together, and we're all starting to kind of mobilize and get information we need uh, so that in the hands of folks that are actually making the hard decisions and adapting to uh, these changing environmental conditions. So on that, I will say again, thank you for joining. It's really been a pleasure to uh, present this to the East West Center community. Um, mahalo. Thank you, Ryan, for the very informative presentation. And thank you for also finishing right on the dot. Okay, so let's move on to the Q&A session. The audience has several questions for you. The first two set of questions pertains to the application as well as the practicality of your project. And the first question we have for you is, have farmers in Hawaii been able to use your program? Well, um, good question. Um, and that, that is definitely gonna be the hope of things. We, uh, our first year of funding was to develop a beta tool. So we haven't officially launched it yet. Um, you can, I think, can't even really access the website yet. So right now what we've done is kind of built the infrastructure for it. We've been having some conversations with uh, at the Hawaii Cattlemen's Council annual meeting. And we've had some conversations at their, their Pauhana events and working with them. But uh, we are still refining the tool. Uh, the next year of it is gonna be to kind of work on the forage growth curves and kind of get into the guts of it and try to make sure that these algorithms are really kind of giving us accurate results. So we're working with uh, the NRCS on that. So again, um, folks haven't used it because it really hasn't been available to them yet. Uh, thankfully, NIDIS has been really generous uh, with the project instead of you know, telling us we had to have something done in a year, they told us that we had to have a beta product in a year. And, and I think that the next year is really what's gonna take it over the top. And, we're constantly thinking of ideas on how we can actually get the ranchers and the farmers to use this because we don't want to just create a product that that's sitting on the shelf. We want to do something that has uh, applicability. So a lot of thoughts going into that. And as we kind of roll things out and get more information, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to tell, but only time will really tell if they actually use it or not. Sounds good. Thank you. Let's move on to the second question under the same theme. And the question is, how versatile is the adaptation planning and practices course when engaging with different indigenous communities? And also what are some of the practices that can be modeled after that approach? Well, uh, okay, so for the first part of the question, um, so, sorry, can you read the, do the first part again? Yes, how versatile is the adaptation planning and practices course when engaging with different indigenous communities. Okay, great. So I will say that the, the, the NIACS, the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Sciences, has developed this course on the mainland and specifically working with tribal communities. So a lot of attention has gone into, you know, working with indigenous cultures there. And what they do is they have this kind of menu of adaptation uh, options. So it's not prescribed. You kind of go into the process and look at the menu and not only think, well, what do I want to do? What is the most appropriate way to actually do that? And I think that, um, you know, a lot of attention has been put on their end, the, the folks who actually developed the course, I just helped facilitate it to really address that particular question. And the second part question, Penwin? Yes, what are some of, 
what are some practices that can be modeled after that approach? Well, in turn, I can speak to, you know, just in terms of engaging in the workshop. Um, one thing that I really got out of this is that we didn't just send her on a flyer and say, hey, come join the workshop. You know, we approached this in a way where we, you know, had a conversation, we had a meeting, you know, we had a couple of meetings in small groups and we kind of explained the process of what we were trying to accomplish and um, what we were trying to achieve. And we kind of really took that kind of grassroots um, you know, bottom up really approach to kind of getting folks to, to engage in the process. And some, some weren't interested and others were. And I think that really, if this answers the question, um, really just taking the time to have conversations with folks and to find out what they're interested in before trying to tell them that they're going to be interested in the product. Um, I think that that's, that's uh, definitely a best practice. Got it. We have one um, recent question that just came in also fits in under the theme of um, application and practicality of your project. And that question is, what are some of the ways you see students using this as a resource in the future for research and data? Well, that's, uh, I mean, there's, I, I went through a lot of stuff here, um, but so there, I, I, I see a limitless amount of educational opportunities through all these products. Now, when I first, we, we first rolled out the HEDP, I had my, I have a seven and eight year old and I had them come in, in and I had them make a rainfall map and I timed them and they both, I gave them one demonstration and I had them both make a rainfall map and they both made one in 20 seconds. And I was like, wow, if my seven and eight year old can make a rainfall map, every kid in the state can make a rainfall map. And uh, why, and why not, you know, and, and, and to think about what it would take to ra make a rainfall map in, in last month's rainfall, it, it pre before the HCDP came around, it would have taken a year's worth of work and special coding skills and geospatial skills and all these things. And now an eight-year-old or seven-year-old can make it with a touch of a button. So, you know, just the accessibility of data is, is a, definitely a low-hanging fruit in terms of developing education stuff. But also in terms of the products, the fact sheets, I mean, it's just a matter of, of taking this information and putting it in ways that teachers can utilize it. Uh, you know, developing the presentation, uh, disaggregating the fact sheet, and, uh, you know, um, creating these really locally uh, relevant uh, examples. You know, when you get a textbook in a school, it doesn't have examples about Pu'uvava on, on the big island of Hawaii. You know, it's, it doesn't have these locally relevant examples. So I think that that's another kind of low-hanging fruit is to take some of this, this, uh, this information for these individual geographies and turn it into like, even this, the idea of CCVD portfolio for the school, taking climate information and turning it in a way that folks can connect with, like, because that's their school. Okay, got it. Moving on to questions focusing specifically on your data. And that question is, are you measuring specific outcomes that flow from the stakeholders having the data available? Are we, what with the outcomes, Mastering? Are you, um, are you measuring specific outcomes? Measuring, I see. Measuring, right. That flow, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So we are we are kind of in the early stages with our pilot partners. Um, I'm getting some feedback from Sierra McDaniel at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. They have uh, made some decisions on when to plant uh, silver swords uh, based on some consecutive dry day analysis that we've done for them. And they are also, um, you know, utilizing the information in other ways to make management decisions. So I'm not measuring them in sense of, well, did the silver swords actually grow? good during that time. But I think that that's, that's, uh, I would hope on her end, you know, I'd get some feedback um, like that down the road, but just finding out that, you know, that the, the pilot partners have utilized that information. I know Elliot Parsons, I think did some, some work on fire breaks with the information we gave him. So I think that there's a, you know, we're, we're too early to really get a good measure, but I think that the feedback I've gotten from at least two of the pilot partners is that they're utilizing the information. Got it. Okay, another question pertains to the data as well. How much data is available for working in the Pacific Islands? Is there sufficient data to do your modeling? Yeah, so um, there are there are a couple. So we're not going to try to get all. There's a, you know Australia has done a good job. Um, the Australia Bureau of Meteorology has a couple of data portals with actual data, and um, so there's a lot of station data. I mean each country's got a different amount of data. So it, it's, it's, it's a big place. So it's hard to answer that question. Um, but for Guam, for example, they're probably, they have about 
you know, 16 rainfall stations over the 70 years, but only six of them in a given day. But if you were to go over to, you know, Palau, there might be one or two. So, you know, uh, I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there, but, you know, and if you go to Kiribati, it could be one or none or, so really, you know, it depends on what country you're in. And I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to go to each country and figure out what we can do there. So in Guam, we could make rainfall maps uh, because of what we had. And in America Samoa, I think we can do that. But if, um, if we go out of the US API or we go to Yap or we go to Chuuk or an island that might not have a rain gauge, we might have to think about something different or try to utilize a different product, a satellite product or something and see how that pans out. But it's gonna be a case by case scenario. And I think um, what I'm not trying to do is the idea of the PDKEs is bottom up. So I'm not trying to solve all the problems right now. We're just going to go one, one at a time and see what we can do. And any information that can be transferable to other countries or stakeholders, we're going to make it available. And hopefully they can utilize and build on some of those products. But um, again, it's all proposal driven and funding driven, you know, where we go and, and how we do. So uh, we'll think broadly and we're welcome to take ideas and, and um, you know, encouragement um, along the way. Okay, sounds like a good plan. Uh, next set of questions is uh, quite long, but we have an audience from Vanuatu Islands in the South Pacific, and I'll, I'll read out the first two questions and then follow by the last question. Any plans to develop citizen science or school materials into Hawaiian or other USPI languages? Also, any plan to make your online tools accessible in these languages? Um, so for Hawaiian, that the question is about Hawaiian, you said Vanuatu. Ha, um, the, uh, the, the author is from Vanuatu okay. and the questions pertains to accessibility of, the, of your project. And yep. so any plans to develop citizens, citizen science school materials into Hawaiian or other USPI languages? Yeah, so I did, um, I might have, um, I might have, uh, you might have missed that part in the presentation, but we are developing, we are translating the fact sheets into, into Olelo Hawaiian. And I do have plans to write a proposal to do the fact sheets translated into Chamorro language um, in Guam. And um, hopefully that th those pan out, but those, those are right now the only language projects that we have going on. But I think that, you know, if there's a need uh, and there's, uh, you know, folks, you know, we'll see what happens with the Hawaiian language. If there's, you know, if there's an interest and folks want to fund some more projects on that and Alyssa's interested in continuing on her work, you know, I don't see any reason why we couldn't um, extend those those services uh, and create other products um, in those languages because there's a real biocultural uh, aspect to this that uh, that uh, is, is extremely relevant. Um, so yeah, hopefully. Okay, and those are going to be accessible online. Yeah, the the Hawaii um, the translated ones will be available. They're just in a draft form right now, and I think we'll probably have a more formal rollout for those uh, somewhere in the near future. Okay, got it. Um, last question for this um, set of questions. Any plan to incorporate traditional knowledge, especially climate indicators into your product? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. I think that, um, you know, uh, in my, my work in the, in the realm of climate adaptation, I think that, you know, folks, uh, the, the conversation is shifting considerably to the fact that folks need to adapt and it, it might not be a new technology that helps them to adapt. <clears throat> it might be a traditional practice that actually helps them to adapt. So um, I think that I am welcome. I'm welcoming the opportunity to kind of uh, take a deeper dive and uh, and incorporate some of those traditional, you know, um, practices or knowledge into some type of material that can be, you know, accessible or digestible uh, for folks, and uh, maybe even get that information to. Now, people that are writing projects and things like that, I think that that's, a, that's kind of the low hanging fruit there is that when these uh, when folks are writing projects to do work, and that's how work is done in the Pacific is a lot of project work. Um, they're looking to program activities that 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 do good at the adaptation. And I think that you know, programming activities that incorporate traditional knowledges and practices is, is going to be a key, a key uh, element to, to adapting to climate change in the future. Okay, there's a new question that just um, came in and I thought it's a very interesting question that is related to the um, answer you've just provided. 
Can you provide an example of how indigenous knowledge help inform the project or data? Hmm. I don't have it. I don't know if I have a, a specific example right now. Um, we, um, we, and the Hawaii Climate Data Portal, we've taken some care mm -hmm. to kind of develop uh, uh, a section on cultural knowledge. And um, I'm trying to build that out with some help of some a hui of indigenous scholars right now. And there's been, being some work being done right now um, with some grad students that are kind of uh, bridging that gap. So um, hopefully in the future, I can answer that question a little more readily, but it's kind of out of my wheelhouse. I don't work directly with that, but I'm, I'm looking forward to, to highlighting that, that, that work once it's, uh, once it's been executed. There's some ongoing stuff going on right now on that front. Okay, got it. Looks like we have one more questions and we have five minutes left. So feel free to take your time to answer this last question. Or if, if the audience has additional questions, feel free to submit it in the Q&A box. And this question that I see is, any thoughts about developing such program for fun pay? Well, yeah, I think that there's no, there's no geographical bounds on this project. Right now, um, we have a proposal to do some work in Guam, Palau, and Yap. It's a very small proposal. I'm not even sure how much we'll get done in, in Palau and, and Yap at this point, but we'll do something. And, um, but uh, yeah, it's just a matter, again, it's all funding driven and, and, and folks that, you know, that want to work with us, stakeholders on the ground, that's going to help drive the, you know, you need this project doesn't work unless you have someone on the ground that wants to work with you. You know, we can't swoop in and say, hey, you guys need a fact sheet or you guys need this. It's just not how it works. You know, we need to kind of enter in with the stakeholder, with the co-production process, or it's really not, it's not really the basis of the project. So I'm all about it. I don't have any plans on, on leaving East West Center anytime soon unless they kick me out. So I'm, I'm digging in and, and, and I'm working with the Pacific Island Development Program and Maria Tori and feeling like there's, there's a lot of good work to be done and, and looking forward to working in Ponape um, in the future. Okay, sounds good. I see there's a question about sharing the recording of this webinar. Um, I can address that question. Yes, um, the link will be provided um, of the recording to those who have registered. So, so you will have access to the recording uh, of this session. Uh, we have three minutes left and there is one more question. And the question is, do you have a timeline for the rollout of the model into the Pacific? Well, I mean, if, when you say model, if you mean like the CCVD portfolio, um, it's, it's kind of hard to, to the, the the project itself. So we're in the Pacific doing work in Guam right now and potentially plow and yap in the near future. So if the model is the, is the project, we're kind of already there and just kind of taking things in stride. Uh, if it's term of a, of a CCVD portfolio, we haven't, that's, that's in the proposal. We have a proposal in right now that's going to potentially be funded. Um, and we're going to start trying to explore some ways to, to make these portfolios. But Again, we got to Guam and realized that, hey, we need to make rainfall maps. So it's kind of like a chicken or the egg uh, type of thing here. You know, you want to create something, but then you need something that come before it. And I think, um, yeah, we're, we're just, we're just going to keep charging and uh, seeing what, what we can do. That sounds good. I don't see any other questions and it looks like we're finishing right on time today. Thank you very much, Ryan, for providing detailed information on your project. Um, did I see one question? Okay, no, that's not. Okay, sorry, th there is a question. Sorry, I lied. Okay, one more question. Are there plans to develop drought product in the region? Yes, there certainly are. Uh, there's country specific ones. And then I have a kind of a bigger arching goal of putting together some type of a uh, publication on um, drought or impacts of drought in the Pacific. It's kind of something that I think once I kind of get my feet wet a little more and, and, and kind of dig in and see kind of what some of the trends are and things, um, I can I can shoot for that. But in terms of an actual product, I think it's going to be more of a yeah. It, it, there's a lot there's a lot of opportunity for that, but it's a matter of just kind of it's going to take a little time before I can do something that might be uh, at the regional extent, you know, because there's such variability in the Pacific that you know, and with the high islands and the low islands. Um, you know, it, Different, different geographies, different countries, they're gonna require you know, a different approach. So it's, uh, it's all part of the bigger picture. You know? It's all part of the long game anyway.
Okay, sounds good. I really don't see any other questions this time. So we're gonna end this. Thank you again, Ryan, for providing detailed information on your project. And thank you to all our audience for participating and joining us this afternoon. And again, I would like to invite you to attend our next EWC Insights on July 20th for a talk by Dr. Tammy Tabe. Thank you again for participating and have an awesome rest.